having cheated death at the business end of Mr. L's Browning and my own shooter in my parents' box room, I now know that I should have been the fourth victim in the headline making Retted and Murders, alongside my best pal Tony Tucker and two of the members of our firm, Patrick Tate and Craig Rolfe, when they were gunned down in that Range Rover. And I'm still haunted today by the knowledge that my name is on a bullet and someone could be waiting for me any day, any time to finish the job. That's why I live in a home with secure access only. When I walk out the door, I check there's no one suspicious hanging around. No bastards come in to take me out by surprise. They might be waiting out there for me one dark night, but I won't go down without a fight, that's for sure. I suppose it's the price I've got to pay for getting caught up in one of the most notorious multiple murders in England. I was one of the first people hauled in for questioning after the shootings. Because I hadn't been with the victims, the old Bill thought I must have something to do with it. I told him that was crap. Tony was a great mate. Why would I want to see him topped? I'll tell you later what I really think happened that dreadful night when the boys had their brains blown out. Up till then, we'd been ruling Essex like we owned the fucking place. If anyone tried to cross our paths or move in on our business deals, we'd destroy them. It was a brutal, evil world, and I was fueled up most of the time on a cocktail of booze, drugs and adrenaline. We thought we were invincible. I was so hyped up there, there were times when I thought literally that bullets would bounce off my body. The others were the same. We muscled up on steroids to try to look like fucking Arnold Schwarzenegger doing coke and speed to see us through night after night without sleep. Most of the time the four of us went everywhere together and I would almost certainly have been in the Range Rover with them on the night that they were shot if they'd felt they were in danger. But they hadn't asked, so they must have felt safe. How wrong could they have been? I'm sure I was as much an intended target as the other three. They wanted the whole firm out of the way. I can't believe I'm here today to write this book. I just hope I'm still around to finish it. We had become wild bastards in the 80s and early 90s. We had a huge network of bodybuilders who worked for us as club doormen and minders and enforcers, any kind of rough stuff. By controlling club doors, we could control who was running the drugs inside and we made dealers cop up a thousand pound a time to operate in the top places. We were raking in a fortune and spending like there was no tomorrow. Life was one big party. We always went out tooled up, knuckle dusters, coshies, knives, it was as routine as brushing your teeth. For a really serious job, we'd think nothing more of packing a 9mm pistol. We had respect, or I suppose I'd call it fear now, at every place we went into in Essex. Nobody messed with us. Life was a permanent buzz. I'd become addicted to violence, the threat of violence, the idea of violence. There were big drug deals going on, some I knew about, others I didn't, and all the time there was a simmering undercurrent of distrust and hatred building up ready to erupt in open warfare. Too many people were taking too many drugs, and all sensible reason was out of the window. Once we went to buy some Nick Traveller's checks worth around £250,000 from another firm of villains up in East London. They kept messing us about, changing the dates and the times of the meet. So Tony decided we'd kidnap the fuckers to teach them a lesson. We'd range the meet in an out of the way car park in Woodford. Some of us were carrying 9mm guns and the usual assortment of tools. Me and Pat Tate waited until Tony gave the signal, then all hell broke loose. I grabbed the ringleader and pummeled him in the head while Tony and Pat smashed up the others. Pat started hitting one bloke so hard he sent him flying through the air and onto the roof of a car setting the alarm off. Lights started going off all around the place so we all ran to our cars and scarpered leaving the other lot lying about battered and bloody. It was all in a typical night's work for the Essex boys. Total disregard for law and order. I'll tell you more about the terrifying consequences of this job on another Essex villain later on. We lived like kings and parted like animals. We spent fortunes on tailor-made clothes and ran about in Porsches, Mercs and BMWs. Women seem attracted by the aura of violence and they threw themselves at us wherever we went. And I mean really good looking girls, not Essex girl slappers. Pat Tate's appetite for sex was legendary. He'd been released from prison once a gunman blasted him at his home and badly injured him. He was rushed into hospital, bleeding badly and put onto a ward all rigged up with tubes, bandages and plasters. Still, he didn't stop him wanting his end away even when he was in traction. From his bed, he phoned up for some hookers to visit him and he got up to all sorts. He thought it was hilarious. 
We were all pushing our luck with drugs. The night I came face to face with Mr. L's Browning, I was so pumped up on steroids and cocaine, I felt like I walked through walls. The terrible thing about drugs is you don't realise when you're on them how stupid they make you look. I deserved to be shot that night. I behaved like a fucking lunatic. But that's just the way things were. One small example of the way we were running out of control. We were getting up the noses of a lot of people, but we couldn't see the dangers brewing up around us. When I heard that Pat, Tony and Craig had all been wiped out on the Essex farm track just before Christmas 1995, it shook me rigid. I knew I had to take stock of my life and get my head clear of all the shit that was going on in there. It was three years before the killers were finally brought to justice and that gave me time for a long, cold, clinical look at where I was. My best mate was dead, my head was done in with drugs, my liver and kidneys had been fucked by steroids. And I would need medical treatment for the rest of my life, however long that might be. My marriage was on the rocks and every relationship I'd had was wrecked by philandering and paranoia. Not a great track record. I know that the men who were convicted of killing the boys, Michael Steele and Jack Worms, are banged up for life, but I can't shake the fear that I might be the next one to catch a bullet if old scores are going to be settled. The murders were supposed to have happened after Tony, Pat and Craig had been lured to a farm track on a bogus drugs deal. Maybe yes, maybe no. Whatever happened, they paid too great a price. Meanwhile, I'm keeping my head down and trying to rebuild the shattered remnants of my life, making sure I'm one jump ahead of any bastard that comes looking for me. I'll never forget the day just before the murders when I went to my mate Tony's house and saw him out of his head and injecting cocaine into a vein. Here was a man who was so proud of his body, a fitness fanatic, and there he was pulling down his shirt sleeves trying to hide 30 fucking needle holes from me. I was shocked. But then I'd got no room to criticise. I was on steroids for years and in my opinion they are the worst drugs of all by far. The emotional and physical side effects are catastrophic. You can become impotent or you can go the other way and become a sex addict. That's the way I went. I became a rampant super stud. I wanted to fuck 8, 9, 10 times a day. I had two girls on the go at the same time then but still wasn't satisfied. That caused problems with relationships when I started looking elsewhere. I was a horrible, revolting sexual predator and couldn't see it. I've seen six or seven mates die in the last six years. I've seen a lot of things and I've done a lot of things. I've been to a lot of funerals. Now I've won my toughest battle. I've got clean of drugs and for the sake of my kids and my girlfriend and the few people who still believe in me, I've got to make sure my funeral is not the next one. Anna's screams will haunt me till the day I die. Long, anguished howls of despair as she learned the terrible truth about the savage murder of her lover and my best pal, Tony Tucker. In those few moments, on a bitterly cold December day in 1995, I became embroiled in one of the most notorious gangland killings in criminal history. Initially, I became the number one suspect. I went into constant police surveillance for weeks. I went on my own quest for revenge, intent on wiping out the bastards who'd taken Tony's life. The first I knew that something was wrong was a phone call at about 10.30 in the morning from a mate saying, I think something's happened to Tony and the boys. I said, what do you mean? What sort of thing? Something bad, he said. He'd heard something on the grapevine, but wasn't saying much in case it was wrong. I switched on the radio to catch the news. It was there on the 11am bulletin. The bodies of three men have been found in a Range Rover on a farm in Retted in Essex. I shredded. I knew Tony, Pat and Craig used the Range Rover. I'd remembered the number, F424 MPE. I knew they'd been planning a bit of secret business in Essex, but surely they couldn't be dead. The Essex boys were invincible, weren't they? I rang Andy, who worked for Tony on one of his health shops. Have you heard anything? I asked. No, mate, he said. I was getting really bad vibes by now. Can you go around and see Tony's missus as if she knows anything? I asked. Sure, mate, he said. He phoned half an hour later. He was with Anna. She hadn't seen Tony since the previous night, but she, that wasn't unusual and she had no reason to worry. Oh, Christ, mate. The police have just arrived, he told me on the mobile. They're at the door. They're talking to Anna now. Then I heard the awful screams in the background as Anna's world collapsed around her. I slumped onto my bed, sobbing like a baby, confused, distraught, fearful. This, I knew, was just the start of a dreadful nightmare, 
and the police quickly made it clear that they thought this could be the onset of a vicious gangland war with more bloodshed to be expected. I'd been a close pal of Tony Tucker's for five years, so it was no surprise that the old bill were on my doorstep within a matter of hours. We were both from the back streets of East London and vaguely knew each other as kids. We met up again at his shop in Ilford where he sold bodybuilding gear, sports equipment and health foods and had a security outfit in the back offices supplying doormen for nightclubs. He was doing really well. He was shrewd in business and highly successful with his turnover from providing club doormen earning in excess of £5,000 a week. There was an instant mutual respect when we met up in the early 90s. We were both fit, both bodybuilders and shared the same interests in life. Birds, booze and parties. He was shrewd with people too. He didn't tolerate fools gladly and was quick to make judgments about people he had only just met. I thought he was often too harsh with people, but he wasn't often wrong. Be careful, Carl, he said. Most people are only using you. Don't trust anyone. It was ironic that on the night he was killed, he'd gone down a lonely country lane in the dead of night. He'd clearly trusted someone and had blown him to kingdom come. That's what brought the cops to my doorstep. It didn't take them long to find out that we were best mates and Tony had obviously been double-crossed by someone he'd believed to be a good pal. We need to talk to you to eliminate you from our inquiries, which really means we thought you might have done it. Where were you last night? I was in deep shock. I was worried, I was angry, and I didn't want to tell them anything. Quite frankly, my first thoughts were that the old bit themselves had killed the boys. The tragic death of policeman's daughter Leah Betts from ecstasy a few months earlier triggered rumours that this was a brutal revenge shot down a dark lane to try to make it look like some sort of drugs war. I was horrified that they are now considering me as a suspect. Why the fuck would I want to murder my best mate? I asked them. I didn't tell them how close me and Tony were. At that moment in time, I wasn't saying anything to anybody because I didn't trust anybody. If they'd dug around, they'd have found out the obvious that me and Tony did a bit of security work together, that we parted a lot together and that we were the best of mates. There'd have been a lot of mutual favours. Tony would give me moody invoices for security jobs to keep the taxman happy and I'd helped him with a club he was minding in Wandsworth and needed to sort through some bother with a little team of local villains. I took some of my boys up there and dealt with it. We stood beside Tony like mafia hoodlums. The locals thought I'd taken over the door, but I told them, no, I'm just a friend. If you take on Tony, you take on us as well. We were both doing well out of the muscle business. I'd got my own company, doing club doors, concerts, sports events, that sort of thing. Made enough to live well. Tony rented me an office next to his premises in Ilford, and we sort of worked side by side for a few years. I was doing okay, but I made what I spent. If I'd made 10 grand, 20 grand or 30 grand, I'd spunk it all away. But Tony had the style and the business brain. He knew how to turn over real money and he made it work for him. He knew how to run a company for a year, then liquidate it and swap the directors about so no one knew where the cash was going, least of all the tax man. He was really on the ball, fit, sharp, going places, a real professional. He was the one with the big house, the smart accountant, the flash cars and his serious money in the bank. We used to joke, he was like a mafia godfather character and I'd call him Tony Mancino for a laugh and he loved it. I was in his office one day when Nigel Ben phoned and asked me to do the security for his next fight. I'd already met Nigel's brother Danny when we were training in the same gym in Forest Gate when we were teenagers. Later on when Nigel had just come out of the army and was getting ready for his first pro fight Danny introduced me to him at the room at the top in Ilford so we met briefly. We're chatting a few times since while I was on the door at clubs like Alistair's and Echo's and so we were on chatting terms and now Nigel was really making the big time as a fighter with world title ambitions. He'd said a couple of times that I needed a bit of work to give him a ring but I'd never been someone to jump on a bandwagon and hadn't taken him up on it. Tony didn't know I knew Nigel and Nigel didn't know I knew Tony and Nigel didn't know anything about our criminal activities. He'd bought his vitamins, iron tablets and other similar legal supplements off him when he was in training. Tony was more than happy to do the security for the next fight. It was the needle match return fight against Chris Eubank in 1993, the one the entire British public were waiting for. Tony said, oh, I've got my mate Colton here with me. And Nigel said, I know Colton, bring him along for the fight. That was the start 
of the three-way friendship that lasted through Nigel's career up till Tony's murder. Tony respected Nigel as a boxer and also liked him as a person. Once, Nigel was having some minor trouble with his wife Sharon and Tony was having some woman trouble as well and Nigel went to Tony's house and they sat and they had a good moan and a few tears. They really gelled together. Then there was me, totally different again, but we were all really bonded and become good mates. They were good times. We'd do the fight security together. I'd go with Nigel when he took the pre-fight blood tests or when he went to the toilet or changing rooms or would walk into the ring. There was a young handicapped boy called Tim whom Nigel had befriended and whatever happened in a fight, the first thing Nigel would do was see him and give him a kiss and he liked us to help Tim get him backstage. He was a great human being, Nigel. He loved that kid and the boy loved him. On the night of the Gerald McCullen fight, at the London Arena in 1995, Tim was there as usual, and Nigel's second wife, Caroline. But there was some trouble brewing early. I needed to make sure everyone was going to be safe. We want Nigel to his corner. When the fight started, I went to keep Caroline and Tim company because you couldn't see much from behind the corner. There was this big black security guard barring my way. Then Nigel hit the deck in round one and looked in trouble. Caroline jumped up worried and leant forward, naturally enough. This black geezer started pushing her back. I said, hey, don't do that. It says Mrs. She sat down and held my hand. It was a vicious war going on in the ring. With every punch, I could feel her squeezing me, taking the pain for Nigel. The black security guard stood right in front of Tim. Then Nigel turned the fight around and knocked McKellen out with some brilliant punches. We were all cheering and yelling and got up on the ringside cuddling Nigel. There were 13,000 people in there all going mad. Right in the middle of it, the black bloke tells me I've got to get off the ringside. I said, don't you put your hands on me. Tempers were flaring and Nigel could see what was happening. Even with all the pandemonium going on, he came across and took the bloke. Hey, lay off, he's security. The bloke wouldn't take no for an answer and he was trying to push me off the ring. He said something, I can't really remember what it was. So bang, I headbutted him and spatted his nose. Tony was also on the outside edge of the stage holding onto the ropes. So I shouted, oh fuck, I've nutted him. The bloke tried to have another go and pushed me off. There were TV cameramen trying to film it for millions of Sky viewers to see. So we ducked out of the way because we didn't want the bad publicity. Then the teamwork snapped into action. As the bloke reeled back, trying to keep a foothold, Tony hit him, crack, and he took off right up into the air. And where has he landed? Right on the judge's table. This fucking huge lump had spattered right down in front of them and they were all there in their bow ties looking up to see what had happened. We were busy now trying to do a damage limitation job. I was holding a bloody great gash on my forehead. Frank Bruno had seen what had happened and he came over to see if he could help. It was fucking mayhem. I was bleeding, the black guy was bleeding from a busted nose and was laying on the judge's table. McKellen was still unconscious in the ring so we needed to get Nigel out to safety. Then... Through the commotion, Nigel's cut men, Denny Mancini, clocked what had happened and came across to give me first aid treatment and stop the bleeding. I mean, the claret was just gashing down my face. It was like I'd headbutted a brick wall. The atmosphere was evil and getting worse. Then as Nigel was doing a TV interview, the black geezer was there again, staggering in front of me, his face all busted up, and he's standing there, arms folded, threatening me, challenging me. By now, I was really pissed off. So I said, tell you what, I'll let you do me from behind and turn my back. The tension was unbelievable. I could hear someone in the crowd shouting, Carl, Carl. There was a lot of geezers there who would have known me, so I wasn't too surprised. Then someone or something was tapping me on the back of my hands. I looked down and someone was pushing my knife my way. It had been passed through the crowd, past the security boys and someone who obviously thought I was in serious trouble. I looked at the blade, pushed it away and said, no, I don't need that. It vanished back into the crowd. I thought, thank fuck for that. I don't want to be seen on prime television cutting up a bloke. That's a sure recipe for a thrive stretch. Things were coming down a bit and McKellen was taken off the hospital and Nigel was walking back from the ring. He was a proud man and wanted to do it on his own. Head held high. Every bit of him was hurting. He whispered to me, Cole, don't let go of me. He was like jelly. His legs were buckling under him. We walked out through the crowd and he'd gone. I thought he was dying. Me and Tony carried him into the ambulance 
and he flinched in agony every time we touched him. My job was done and Nigel was on his way to the doctors. By now, everybody was looking for me and Tony over the fight we'd had with the black guy. We'd rushed upstairs to Nigel's changing room and Denny Mancini did a few cut jobs on my injuries, cleaned me up, put some plasters on and slipped us out through a side door. There's fucking uproar going on over you two, he said. Get out before they find you. We didn't need a second invitation. We're on a motor and away.